Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our online training class today. Um, my name is Jason Gabrinis, and I'll take you through the next uh, 30, 45 minutes or so of material. Now, if you're watching us on Zoom, if you have any questions throughout this, uh, just look at the top or the bottom of your screen, wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a little button that says Q&A. Click on that, it'll open a new window. You can type in your question, hit submit, and I'll get to the questions at the end of the presentation. If you're watching us live on YouTube, you can use the live chat function. You can type in your question in there, and then I will make sure to get to those at the end as well. If you're not watching this live on YouTube, say after the fact, uh, the live chat won't be there, so you could leave us a comment. Um, for that, with that, my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last seven years, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. Uh, so I had uh, 30 different Snap-on franchisees that I worked with, as well as the customers that they serviced uh, in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Before that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I was a dealership technician at a Subaru dealership. And over time, it just became the default diagnostic guy, I guess you could say, right? So I always end up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would seem to crop up on those vehicles. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth was trying to figure out all these strange head scratcher type problems that would come into my bay. Before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been about 25 years under the hood for me. So our topic today is what we're calling data bus testing and diagnosis. And this is part two of two. So if you were with us last week, uh, we went through part one and that was our, our basic networking strategy, so to speak, and how we would diagnose basic networks, such as our low speed network. So J1850 variable pulse width and pulse width modulated versions. We talked about that. We also talked about uh, K line bus. We also talked about LIN bus. So LIN bus is a single wire network used for master and slave control of say motor switches and the like. And then we did a little bit on CAN. Uh, so for this week, we are going to start with CAN. We'll do a little recap of kind of what we talked about last week, because I understand not everyone uh, was here last week, right? So we're gonna do a little bit of a recap there, talk about CAN and then move on faster and faster in our network, so to speak. So we'll go and talk about Flexray, most, and then Ethernet. And all, you may have heard of that as DOIP or Diagnostics over IP. Uh, it's just another way to call that. So a refresher on networks, what mo just about all networks are going to work on what we call the voltage differential, the difference between the high and the low of the voltage signal. And all networks work on a voltage range of some sort. You just need to know what that is from your manufacturer. So here's an example on the screen. This is from a LIN bus. And we see we have a high side and a low side. Uh, in this case, it's a constant high side and then it drives low in order to send information. And this is the, uh, these are the different bits of data here, the on and offs, the ones and zeros. <clears throat> If we see on this vehicle, uh, what we want to see on Linbus is a 12 volt differential between the high side and the low side, give or take, you know, a, a few tenths of a volt on either side. So in this case, this is uh, going to be battery voltage on this vehicle. So it's 13.35 volts or whatever line voltage is. And then it goes down low. On the low side, uh, we see it's pretty close to a volt. So it's actually nine tenths of a volt, 0.91 volts. And then the difference between the two, between the high side and the low side, the delta they call that, is 12.44 volts. Uh, so we see that is really, you know, it's less than a half a volt uh, difference between the high side and the low side there. So that's what we're working with is our voltage differentials. And we want to be aware of what the voltage differential needs to be on the particular network we're working on. How will we access the networks to test them? The majority of the time you want to, you, you don't want to be breaking wiring harnesses apart and things like that. So we want to be uh, plugging into maybe the diagnostic connectors, usually the easiest place to get to those data lines, at least the communicating to the vehicle data lines type that we want to get to. And for the purposes of this course, what we'd really want, or this part of the course, we would want to concentrate on uh, pins four and five, which are ground, pin 16, which is always power, and then pin six and 14, which would be our main CAN bus for the vehicle. You'd also want to look through the wiring diagram because not every bus terminates uh, in the same place, right? So the main CAN bus on a vehicle, if it is CAN communication, will be on pin six and 14 at the DLC and you can see the pattern. Some vehicles have multiple CAN buses on them, so they'll use up multiple uh, 
connectors or multiple pins on the connector on the DLC there. So I know on like a GM vehicle I looked at once we had uh, 6, 14, 13, 12, 11, and 3 all had networks on them and they're all CAN networks. They were just, you know, you know, engine CAN, chassis CAN, object detection CAN on that particular vehicle. Uh, so you just, you probably get pretty good at reading a wiring diagram when you're testing network, uh, network buses as well. And then how are we going to access the connector, that diagnostic connector? Because we don't want to test just by simply stuffing our probes in there. That might cause a communication issue in the future as well, because we could damage the connector, right? Probably also very difficult to get to the back of that connector because they don't usually put it in a good, easy place to get to, right? Usually it's under the dash somewhere and have to take a few panels off perhaps to even get to the back. So the easiest way to access is use some sort of a DLC breakout box. This one happens to be the Blue Point branded one. And they're all pretty much, you know, for all intents and purposes, the same layout. Uh, you know, we'll have a uh, about a two foot cord or so that goes and plugs into the DLC. And then on the other side of the box, we have another DLC connector where we would connect our scan tool. So that way we can be communicating with the vehicle at the same time. And we can be also reading the signals, the voltages going up and down those wires by tapping in using the banana jacks on the breakout box. There's 16 pins there for the 16 pin connector. So we can use my scan tool to communicate while I use my scope to read the lines. And yes, you do need to use a scope in order to check really any networks because voltmeter just it's not built for that, right? So recap on CAN. You now high-speed CAN consists of two twisted wires with a transmission rate of 100 to 500 kilobits per second. So that's for standard CAN. Uh, we also have a slightly faster version of CAN that's out there. It goes up to one megabit per second. So that's actually twice as fast as, as this speed here. Uh, when you get down to about the 100 kilobit per second range, you might be calling about, maybe you've heard of mid-speed CAN, medium-speed CAN. Uh, that sort of sort of bus uh, be, be in that 100 kilobit range. Now, CAN uses a two to about a two and a half volt differential. There's an acceptable range of where that data can reside in the in the in the uh, in the voltage. One signal circuit is identified as CAN high, and the other side is identified as CAN low. So we'll see CAN high on what we call pin six on the DLC, and CAN lows on pin 14. At each end of the data bus as well, there is a 120 ohm termination resistor between the CAN high and the CAN low circuits. And that essentially works as a stop sign. So your network traffic's going around and flowing around throughout the network. And then when it hits that 120 ohm resistor, that knows that it's the end of the line. We don't have any further to go there. And uh, you know, it would look something similar to this. This is a simplified drawing of a, of a uh, CAN bus, right? So I have pin six, that's that CAN high, pin 14 is that CAN low and then my 120 ohm resistor on either end. More often than not, that resistor will be inside a control module, so inside the ECM, TCM, BCM, what have you. Uh, there can also be blank connectors on, on this as well. I know uh, like when we worked at Subaru, we had an optional alarm module that would plug in uh, if they wanted to upgrade their alarm and it had a, a uh, CAN bus connector underneath the seat. You take the 120 ohm resistor that they just had plugged in on the end and then you'd plug in the module and it would power up and, and it would go and, and do communication how it would need to go. Uh, so really for testing a CAN bus, as I said, we need to use a, a scope, right? Cause you're not gonna be able to see the data going back and forth. If you use a meter, about the only thing you can test on CAN with a meter is just maybe the uh, resistance right there and check the resistors, right? So you put in one, one end in pin six, one end in pin 14. And then since it's reading both wires, both wires have a 120 ohm resistor at the end for all intents and purposes. We have two wires, so we divide it in half. So it's an average when we're reading that. So we see around about 60 ohms when you're checking between both lines on a CAN bus. Now a CAN bus is expandable, right? it's modular. We can add additional controllers there and they'll start communicating. Want to add some more controllers? Sure, we can do that too. Add a few more controllers there and they'll continue communicating with each other. We can also take modules away. Right, take it down to only one module on a CAN bus. So, so CAN bus to the DLC, so, so think about it that way. Uh, we can still communicate with one module on a CAN bus. It was just from the DLC to the, to the module. Then if we were to inspect the data bus when we're looking at CAN, this is an example of a good pattern when it comes to CAN. Uh, so what we see is there's two different signaling uh, levels. So we have two and a half volts where it's sitting here. We call that idle state, so it's not transmitting data. When it transmits data, it goes up from that two and a half volts, about a volt, volt and a quarter, 
looks like it's about three and a half volts there. So that's one volt. And then it comes down about a volt, volt and a quarter on the other side. So we see that two to two and a half volt uh, range in between. And that is our data packet. And we're also looking at this at a hundred microsecond scale. So that's 100 millionths of a second from this zero to this 100. That's 100 millionths of a second of time passing. And we don't see the whole data packet here either. If we came out to maybe a 200 microsecond, we should be able to see the whole thing. 400, we'd be able to see it very well. And once again, that's on pin six and 14. Now I recapped CAN because it is also uh, pertains to what we're gonna talk about you know, on our other two, not, two wire networks for the most part. Uh, the structures are very similar. Uh, the patterns are similar uh, when we go along. So I just wanted to have that as, as kind of our baseline here, right? So then we get on to FlexRay. Now, why do we have FlexRay? Let's do a little history lesson on this too. So uh, CAN bus has been around since the 90s, really, but in vehicles standardized, 2006 is when that came online. Uh, so any vehicle had to have CAN bus communication on their main data bus network. And as we said, at the fastest, it is one megabit per second, right? So one, one megabyte, if you want to think of it that way per second. Uh, and then the FlexRay bus, we needed something faster because as CAN expanded and we added more and more modules to this, then we say, okay, now we're having congestion, we're having data collisions, we're having problems here with communication speed, so we need something faster. Well, first off, they started dividing the networks. So like I said on that GM there, I had three different CAN buses that I could access. Um, and then even that's not enough now. We have way faster signals. We need a faster network. So that's when they came along with FlexRay standards. So FlexRay, for all intents and purposes, it's laid out a lot like CAN. Right? So it consists of two twisted wires. And on this, though, the transmission rate is up to 10 megabits per second. And a lot of that comes down to the underlying technology, the hardware and the chips, et cetera. And it uses a one volt differential. So it has less to distance to travel to, to, to create their signal so they can actually create it faster. One signal circuit is identified as signal high and the other one is signal low. Also on this, depending on the manufacturer, we can they can build in um, uh, redundancy. Right, so I could have one line, one set of lines and another set of lines that are identical to each other, just you know, parallel. Uh, so if one line, set of lines fails, the other lines can take over. So there can be redundancy built into it. At each end of the data bus, there's an 800 to 100 ohm termination resistor between the high and low circuits. So that really depends on the manufacturer as well. So it's not that straight 120 ohms as the CAN standard. We have a range that it could be. But just so you can see the similarities between FlexRay and CAN. FlexRay is like a very fast CAN. It's, it's a little different in the voltage ranges. It's definitely a lot faster, 10 times faster. So here is just an example of FlexRay bus uh, signal off a of BMW. If you watch that video that I played at the very beginning, if you were around for that, uh, walk through testing a FlexRay bus on a BMW. And you can see there is uh, my signaling there. And it is considerably faster. All right, so I'm going to compare this to the CAN we just looked at. So if we look at a, a zero there, 100 microseconds there, there are three packs of data on that screen. So that's three sets of data, whereas I can only look at maybe half a set of data on the CAN. So if I wanted to put those side to side, we see CAN, we see maybe half, and then we see three on there. So if I was to expand this to say 200 microseconds, we'd probably be able to get the whole you know, string of data on CAN on a 200 microsecond screen, uh, whereas we can see three on a 100 microsecond screen on FlexRay. So if we were to compare that to a 200 microsecond on a FlexRay, we'd see six packets of data, right? So it's it's considerably faster than CAN, so we can throughput way more data on that. All right, so those are your uh, those are two of the main uh, vehicle communication networks we're wor working with today. Um, there's a couple more that are even faster and a little bit different. So this one, most, is a little bit different than our CAN and our flex rate. It is still two, a two-wire bus. Uh, it's not necessarily a twisted pair, though. It could just be a two-wire uh, non-twisted bus. It can also be copper on some vehicles, and it can also be um, uh, fiber optics on other vehicles. All right, so depending on how the manufacturer wants to set it up. But most is you know another network you may have heard out there, so we figured we'd at least talk about it. Uh, so most stands for media oriented systems transport. Uh, the infotainment network is dedicated high speed multimedia streaming data bus 
independent from cans. So when you find a most bus on a vehicle, it's going to be independent from the rest of the vehicle. Maybe you'll have a gateway module to translate between, uh, but this is used exclusively for multimedia data. So video, audio, and the like. So the most bus is configured in a physical hardwired loop with each device within the bus, sending and receiving data on an assigned address in a set order. The radio is the master and monitors the bus for vehicle configuration, infotainment data messages and errors on the bus. So the, the radio is in charge and then each module on that bus talks in order. So here's an example. Wiring diagrams is off a of Cadillac and we have the radio here and we see how we have these arrows which indicate signal direction. So from the radio, it goes to the audio amplifier. From the amplifier, it goes to an instrument cluster. From the instrument cluster, it then goes to the media disc player. From the disc player, it goes to the human machine interface control module, which is a really fancy way of calling a touch screen. It's right where the human and the machine interface by touching the screen. And then it goes up to the radio, All right? So it's just a hardwired loop. And I'm going to tell you more often than not, I think you're probably not going to be breaking into this to, to do some you know, wire testing uh, to test the signals. The signals are similar to how CAN and FlexRay are set up. You know, we have a voltage differential, a high and a low. Um, but more, more than likely, you'll be investigating this by using codes. Or you're going to find your U codes, and then you'll go through the diagnostic flow chart with that. More often than not, you're probably not going to be probing some of these wires. If it's fiber optics, you're not going to be probing the wires because what are you going to see? You're going to see little flat pulses of light faster than your eye can process it. And uh, you'll have, you know, signal decoders and encoders on either end. So you can't really see that what's going on. So in this case, it's going to be more of a code based workflow on that. And then we get to the new kit on the block, Ethernet or uh, using Ethernet protocol on a vehicle. We can also call that diagnostics over IP. So it uses IP addresses. So internet protocol uh, uses that they, everyone has a set address, just like on maybe a home network in, in your house or in your shop. You also have this style of network on cars now. Uh, by and large, it's internally on the vehicles, communicating externally out to the scan tool is still usually handled by, say, a CAN bus, and then it translates inside the, uh, the gateway. Uh, so, in, and also uh, there's a couple different versions of Ethernet. The most popular one that you'll see out there on automobile will be the 100 megabit per second version. We have megabit Ethernet and we have gigabit Ethernet, which is more common at home, but there are some manufacturers using that. We'll talk about that in a second. So the 100 megabit per second Ethernet uses what we call a PAM3 voltage signal. This is completely different than anything we've seen so far on our two wire networks. It is a twisted wire. It can be multiple pairs of twisted wires on that connector. PAM stands for pulse amplitude modulation. So it changes the height of the pulse, so the amplitude of that pulse. And there are three different voltage levels. That's where the three part comes in on PAM3. There is also, uh, when you get into gigabit and faster networks, they call that PAM5. And I think there's even maybe faster than that, but PAM5 would be five different voltage signals. So by and large on motor vehicles, automotive applications, we see that PAM3 voltage signal. So what does that look like? As I said, it's considerably different than anything we've seen so far on our two wire networks. What we see when we look at an ethernet signal, there really isn't a lot of repeating patterns either. It's gonna depend on what's inside that little bit of data. Goes to about a, a one volt on the top to a negative one volt on the bottom. So it's actually more of like an AC signal that goes on either side of zero. Zero's here in the middle. What these red lines are going to represent are signal levels. Depending on how the designer designed the system, uh, they will set a demarcation line. Any signal above one of the demarcation lines will be considered a plus one. Anything below the lower demarcation line will be considered a negative one. And then anything in between those is considered a zero. Uh, so in this case, I just put them at you know, 500 millivolts above and 500 millivolts below, pretty much just cutting it in half or cutting in thirds, so to speak. So I have three signal levels, a plus one, a zero, and a minus one. And that's how it splits it up. And as you can see, there really isn't a ton of repetition in this signal. So there really isn't a what we'd say a known good, right? What's a known good CAN signal? We can look that up and we can see because CAN looks like CAN. Flex ray, that known good flex ray signal looks like a flex ray signal on anything with flex ray. When we get to ethernet, 
throw that out the window, right? We're not going to really be saying here's a known good, right? Because there's different parts of the data packets and there's a whole lot of reading material out there. If you really want to get into the weeds on that, I'm just trying to give you a, a good overview of how it works. And once again, with this, you're not really going to be diving into necessarily testing it with a scope because you do need specialized equipment for it. The way the signals are set up and the way the, the uh, hardware is set up. You want to use specialized equipment for that. So this picture is actually off a specialized scope used in a lab for, say, you know, communications networks, server farms, that sort of thing, All right? So it is filtering through our internet technology is filtering down into motor vehicles, and it is something you need to be aware of. But as of right now, once again, kind of like with the most, it is going to be more of a code-based workflow, I think, out there. Uh, so I did want to investigate though, uh, we hooked up to a 2018 Volvo that has ethernet on it. Uh, Cause we know we had to have internet or ethernet communication protocol to scan, talk with the scan tool. Uh, so we wanted to see how it was laid out. This is a wiring diagram from, uh, from Volvo. And we see there's the DLC here on pin six and 14, we have a CAN bus, All right, So it's just a regular twisted pair CAN bus goes to this module over here, which I think is one of the uh, gateway modules it's got flex rate CAN and LIN coming in and out there. And then over on this side, we have uh, another module that it goes directly to as well. That's a CAN bus as well. So on this vehicle externally, we're talking CAN, right? So that's our, that's our usual diagnostics there. But then when we get internally to the vehicle, the internal networks are ethernet. That also brings us to a, an interesting thing that we found when we were in the shop looking at this Volvo. You're talking to the tech waiting to hook up to the car. And he said, oh yeah, I have these three cars all hooked up to this one computer right now. And I'm flashing them all over Wi-Fi because that's how they do it at the dealership, right? We were at the dealership. Uh, so they're hooked up on their own network and they can connect to a car via Bluetooth for diagnosis. They can hook to a vehicle over Wi-Fi, high-speed Wi-Fi in order to for diagnosis and flashing. So they don't even need to bring a scan tool over to the vehicle anymore because they can scan right from their desktop computer on their bench and they can scan a car and they can flash a car. And I guess as a order of protocols, what they normally do when a vehicle comes in for anything, they'll check it for updates because apparently there are enough software updates up there. They have to update just about every single car that comes in. They put out enough software updates out there for any of the modules and they flash it over Wi-Fi in the shop. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. And that seems to be where the industry is headed, right? In the, in the wireless vehicle communication there. Uh, so when we hooked up on this Ethernet vehicle, as I said, it is a CAN bus back and forth into that gateway module. So that's what we see at the CAN bus. We will see at pin six and 14, we see a standard CAN bus signal, right? So I have my two and a half volts in the middle. I have my volt, volt and a half on the top. Looks like it's about three and a half volts up. About three, uh, about two, one and a half volts down. So that is my uh, my two volt uh, range there. So it is just standard CAN bus until you get into the interior network of the vehicle. So that brings me to how do I communicate with a vehicle that uses Ethernet protocol internally because the computer speaks in Ethernet and the other modules on the vehicle uh, speak Ethernet. So there are vehicles out there that have this, and it's actually been about four or five years. They've started uh, filtering in out there uh, as far as communicating with the vehicle. So the Jaguar I-PACE 2019 model year, Land Rover 2018 and newer Discovery, Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, Range Rover Velar. And then pretty much any Volvo since 2016 and newer, they've been slowly adding ethernet to all their line. Um, so in order to speak to any of these vehicles that we have on the screen, if you have a snap-on scan tool, uh, you will need some accessories. Uh, so in order to speak to any of those vehicles and any future Ethernet vehicles too, uh, if you have a Triton D8, an Apollo D8, a Modus Edge, a Modus Ultra, Solus Legend, Solus Edge, Ethos Edge, or P1000 tool, you need this specialized cable right here. You see how it's got this big bump in the middle of the wire where we normally just see a straight wire. That has some chips, et cetera, inside there that does the translation between our scan tool and Ethernet protocol. Uh, if you have a Solus Legend, it came with it or it should come with it in the box. Uh, it's supposed to have that ethernet, that big fat cable in there. If you have an Apollo D9, our latest scan tool that just came out, that is actually built in on the board. So all the translation happens on the board of the tool and then it has a more standardized cable that goes out. It still has twisted pairs inside of the cable. So it is a different cable than the one we had before, but it doesn't have that big pillbox on there. 
and it is a uh, keyed cable, so it only goes in one way. If you have a Zeus or a Varus Edge, uh, in order to communicate with the vehicle, if you have a newer Zeus with Windows 10, it probably came with that S7 module, which would be the black module. Uh, the older Zeus came with a red module. That's how you know the difference. We call that an S5 module. And uh, that doesn't have Ethernet protocol in it. But on the S7, this black one, it does. And then also the Varus Edge, you can change your uh, module, your wireless module, the big one, the S4 module. Uh, you can change that to the S7 as well. Just talk to your Snap-on representative uh, to find out more information on how you might get one of those if you need it. If you don't need it, don't worry about it, I guess, right? And then uh, also, I just wanted to make you aware, this is a, a, over a year old now, but back in May of last year, uh, GM announced that they are introducing, they call the digital vehicle platform. They're calling it the Global B Network platform. So they announced it May 20th, 2019. It was introduced in the 2020 model year Cadillac CT5 sedan and the 2020 Corvette, that mid-engine Corvette they just came out with. So both of those vehicles for 2020 had it. And then coming into 2021, there'll be some more models all the way up through 2023. They're expected to have it rolled out in all of their models by 2023. In this vehicle, they use Ethernet but it's fast ethernet, they use gigabit ethernet. It's capable of processing four and a half terabytes of data an hour, which is a five times increase over where they're at now, which they call Global A, they've been using that for the last 10 years. It also utilizes ethernet communication internally, right? So not externally to the scan tool, but internally inside the vehicle up to 10 gigabits per second. So as I said, they're using gigabit ethernet in there very fast. That's 10 times faster than our, our you know, way faster than our, our regular ethernet we're using on other cars also will offer over the air updates and what i think they're going to be doing is uh either you can probably hook up to your home network and download the update overnight while you sleep you wake up and you have to update your car right just like a windows update or uh maybe it'll even work with the built-in wi-fi or if it has uh, maybe wireless connectivity with the vehicle over maybe 4g or 5g uh may work that way as well where they can push an update to a car Tesla has been doing that for a while where they can just push updates to a car and you can choose to update it then. Uh, so it looks like GM's getting on board with that. And I'm sure the other manufacturers aren't far behind with that either. So that's kind of a, a good overview to see here. Here's what's here. Here's the state of it. And here's where it's going. All right. So let's talk a little bit about on tool functions of where we might, might look here. All right. So let me pull up my, my Zeus here. So if you don't have any questions so far, that's okay. Uh, as I said, if you're watching on Zoom, just uh, put your question in the Q&A box. So find the Q&A on your screen, click on that, submit your question. Looks like we've got a couple, uh, couple of chats coming in here on, on YouTube. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your comments. And uh, you know, if you have any comments on YouTube, please feel free to add those as well. So the first place I wanna go is I'm gonna pull a vehicle I did my first class here. So we had a BMW X4. I go in here and activate that vehicle so I don't have to take as long to ID it. And first thing, thing I want to do is let's look at some wiring diagrams. <clears throat> so I'm going to load into Shopkey and we'll take a look at the wiring diagram. So as I said, you it's very important to go through and, uh, and read the wiring diagram so you can see and uh, understand how that vehicle is laid out. All right, so once I ID the vehicle, I can go here and I'm on my home screen, my main page, and you see I have these quick links. On any vehicle, we have quick links for the vehicle on the page. And then we have wiring diagrams right here, which will list all wiring diagrams for the vehicle. I want to see, you know, we could do a search and sort it down just to an individual module, but I want to see overall network, right? So we can go down here. There's a category called computer data lines. So we go into computer data lines. That'll give us the full however many pages of the networks on the vehicle. So in this case, there's four pages or four panels of uh, data lines here. So I'm gonna open this up and pull up my diagram. You can see there's a wealth of, these are just network lines on this vehicle. It's a 2015 BMW. There is a plethora of wiring in here. And this is just networks, right? Maybe some powers and grounds, but there's, there's no other wires in here. It's just networks. Uh, so this is the central gateway module and that's what translates all the, all the wires. So let me zoom in here a little bit. And let's look at the top right here where the diagnostic connector is. So that's our 16 pin diag connector. Pin 16, that's always power, right? Four and five, that's always ground. Uh, and then we have most of the other pins on here. There's only looks to be one, two, three, four empty pins 
on this DLC. So that gives 12 pins that are doing something on this uh, on this DLC. All right, so it looks like this orange one goes back to the uh, gateway module, All right? And that is an ethernet data line, right? So maybe their factory scan tool uses that for diagnosis there. I know on this car, on, on a Snap-on scan tool, it just goes through CAN, right? But the CAN bus also goes back to the, the gateway module and the gateway sends the signal where it needs to go. So we see we have multiple flex ray buses on here, uh, ground, more ethernet down here. Uh, and then we see we have uh, terminal 30, so that's power and terminal 15 is power. Uh, diagnosis bus, so that'd be our, it looks like that, that's our CAN bus to our pin in six and 14. PT CAN, K CAN, uh, PT CAN again, K CAN again, ethernet again. So there's multiple ethernet networks. There's multiple flex ray networks on here. Uh, there's probably LIN bus in here as well, right? So many manufacturers use LIN bus as well. So we can go all the way back through all of these wires, right? So we have a, a terminating resistor where multiples of these networks terminate. So that also gives us a testing point, a little breakout point there. All right, so we have high speed, low speed, mid speed networks in here. Let me go over a little further so we can get to page four. And that's my transmission control module. And that is my computer, all right? So here's my digital motor electronics or the ECM on the vehicle. So if I click on that, it's going to highlight all of the network wires associated with that. Let me zoom out a bit. I can use this eyeball to dim the other line so I can get rid of the noise there. And we can see it goes to the transmission, other multiple modules here, goes across the screen. The highlight carries through. So it goes across again, page three, page two, page one. And that goes back to my, I have one line that goes to my diagnostic link connector. This one I highlighted earlier. I have one line that goes back to my diagnostic connector and then all the other lines go into by flex ray. And then there's one can line there that goes into my gateway module. So central gateway module on this vehicle is definitely the gatekeeper for you know everything else in this vehicle. So it also could give us a good test point. You know, maybe if we needed to test certain networks, we could access it from this gateway module. Might be a good way to go if we're attacking that. All right, so there's that. Let's also go into some guided component testing because we do have some preset tests for this. You don't really need to remember your voltage levels and where to connect and, and what it's supposed to look like. So we go into guided component tests. So let's say engine, right? Because the engine is where all my network stuff will be. I have a CAN bus. I could go into CAN bus here, get some information on how that works, right? It's going to tell us how, how CAN bus works, what my voltage signals are, two and a half volts. To, uh, to about four volts and then two and a half volts down to one volt for our signal range. We don't want to see zero volts. We don't want to see five volts or 12 volts. If I back up, I can do a signature test. It's going to give me, tell me where to hook up. It's going to give me a known good pattern. It's going to tell me what connector to use. In this case, they want us to go to the PCM. I hit V meter. It's going to automatically set the voltage where it needs to be, automatically sets the time base where it needs to be. And then I can bring those close together and I can see my CAN bus pattern right here. Now this is on a simulator on a BMW, but that is what it should look like. If you look down a little bit further, there's known good. There's what we have going on on the vehicle. You'll also notice I have this high spike at the end. So I want to reiterate this for those of you who weren't here last time. On some vehicles, some manufacturers have decided to put in this extra bit of data at the end. They call that an ACK bit or an acknowledgement bit. That is basically acknowledging that here's the end of my set of data. It's a period at the end of the sentence is what that is. So that is, uh, here's the end of my bit of data. Whatever comes next is, is somebody else, All right? So that's how they can communicate and say which, which uh, module is what on the vehicle. So that don't be worried if you see this high spike at the end on many vehicles, that is normal. Some vehicles, they don't include that. Some vehicles, they do. So we'll see that on the pattern up there. All right, so that is CAN bus. And then we also have built in, we have a flex ray bus as well, flex ray test there. Go in, can do a signature test, same thing. So there's our known good flex ray bus. We'll see a slightly different. So with no bus communication, we see two and a half volts, goes high to 3.1, low to 1.9. That's about 600 millivolts on either side. So that is about a 1.2 volt range. So it's a one to one and a half volt range is what we want to see in there. And here's a typical waveform key on engine off. All right, and as far as anything else, like I said, specialized equipment, and you're probably not going to be testing it with a component tester or a scope in that case. So with that, 
that is the end of two weeks of crash course on networks, I guess you could call this, right? Uh, so let's talk about what we're going to see next week. So the way we structure these classes is we'll do them in five week blocks, right? So we'll have five weeks of new classes. And then once we're done with that five weeks, we repeat because we understand, you know, not everybody's going to be able to see every week worth of classes. Uh, so we're starting over next week with our class one of this five class block. So that is code based diagnostic workflow. And that is actually a two week course as well. So we're going to have, a, you know, a, the first half is next week. The week after that will be the second half. The week after that is going to be, um, it is symptom-based diagnosis. And then we'll have another two weeks of this uh, network diagnosis as well. So we'll be repeating that five weeks starting next week. Um, so you'll be able to join us on Zoom for sure. Uh, you can also join us on YouTube on Tuesdays. We'll be streaming the next two weeks on YouTube. So we get all five classes in the line there uh, on YouTube. And then after that, we'll be taking a pause on that. And then we'll be pausing for the holidays as well. That'll bring us right up to about Christmas, the next five weeks. So we're going to pause for a couple of weeks and we'll start back up again in January with maybe all new classes. I'm not sure yet. We haven't, we haven't decided that. Uh, we may, may take some of our other classes we did way a few months ago and bring those back as well. Not really sure yet. Uh, but with that, definitely register for next week. Hopefully we'll see you then. Um, I will now attack questions, but before I do, I will put up this slide so you can all take a look at this while I'm answering questions. Uh, so my buddy Al McCaskey, who is also on this call, he helps me out with these calls. He does a platform training specific to a tool uh, online as well. He does this on Zoom. Uh, so it's an introduction to your new platform, or even if you've had the tool for a while and you just maybe want to learn a few little tips and tricks you might not be aware of, good class to attend. He pretty much goes through the entire tool. Um, anywhere from setting up your Wi-Fi through, hey, let's set up your free Snap-on Cloud account, right? So we can uh, upload uh, uh, different reports and, and screenshots, et cetera, and share those with our customers. So you can go to snapon.com slash NOT is the place to go to register for his classes. His classes are a little bit down the bottom of the screen. As of right now, we might be doing a website change here soon, but you should see any of the tools there. Just click on the tool and that'll bring you to the class for that. Or above that, a little higher up on the page, we have our class calendar. And then below that, you can register for any of my classes like you're attending right now. I did see a hand raised and I can't hear your question, so to speak. So you do definitely need to um, type it in to the Q&A box, if you will. Okay, so let's see. Let me close the this screen I'm on. There we go. Oops, I didn't want to close that, though. I need to minimize that screen. There we go. Learn how to use PowerPoint, Jason. Okay. There we go. Okay. So uh, Matt asks, I updated the Zeus to Windows 10 and still have the red and black wireless adapter. Do I need to update for Ethernet accessing? Yes, you do need that S7 module uh, for Ethernet, even if you have Windows 10. Um, it's when we made the change to Windows 10 from the factory, that's when they started shipping with the S10s included. So you'll have to get back with them to get that S7 if you need that Ethernet cap capability on your tool. Uh, let's see, Jeremy asks, do I have to have the Ethernet cable if I only need information that would not be on that network? Um, the tool is going to prompt you to have that cable on the tool if you need to communicate with any of those vehicles that have it. So any of the vehicles on that list, if you need to communicate with that vehicle in any way, it's going to need that Ethernet cable, yes. And Lenny says, thanks a lot for helpful info. And, and Lenny, I appreciate, you You know, I see your name in there all the time. So I definitely appreciate your repeat, uh, repeat coming to these classes. It's, it's always good to have, uh, you know, see some familiar faces in there as we go. Looks like on YouTube, we are clear of questions. Looks like on Zoom, we are clear of questions. I did see one gentleman raise his hand. So if you could please, if you do have a question, please feel free to type it in. And I will answer it live uh, this way because we really can't, you know, can't turn your camera on, can't turn your microphone on, so I can't hear your hear your voice. So uh, if you type that in, I'm more than happy to answer it for you. I'll wait another minute or two just because I'm not the fastest typer in the world either. I take a look at who is here. I see a lot of familiar names on here, so that's good. I always like when you guys show up week after week. It's kind of kind of feels like a little family, right? We're starting to build a little little training family, I guess, right? If you want to think of it that way. I know it kind of sounds a little cheesy maybe, but all right, good deal. Uh, not seeing any other questions come in. 
So with that, I definitely appreciate all of you attending tonight. Hopefully we'll see you back again next week for our uh, code-based diagnosis class. And with that, be safe this week and enjoy the rest of your week and take care of yourselves.